Welcome everyone. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are here tonight with all of you in person and virtually to celebrate Adia Harvey Winfield's brand new book, Gray Areas, How the Way We Work Perpetuates Racism and What We Can Do to Fix It. Adia is here in conversation with Karita L. Brown, and um, we are. This is our third event in as many weeks uh, with Karita, which is wonderful. So um, it feels like old home week already. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Brown first. She's a sociologist, professor, oral historian, and public intellectual whose research centers on the ontologies of systemic racism and the fullness of Black life. An educator, public speaker, author, and humanist, she's known for empowering her readership students and organizations to be active participants in driving equity and justice. Dr. Brown's body of work combines her expertise in data-driven social science research, her vast experience in navigating complex global organizations, and her love of the arts. These insights bring actionable and reparative knowledge to the public. She is a professor of sociology at Emory University, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on race and racism, sports and society, and historical archival methods. She served as the inaugural director of racial equity at the Los Angeles Lakers from the years 2020 to 2023, and she became an NBA champion in 2020. Brown also currently serves on the board of the Obama Presidency Oral History Project, and her most recent book, The New Brownies Book, A Love Letter to Black Families, has just come out, and I think y'all got a copy of it up there somewhere. Yeah, we can hold it up for folks um, because it is hot off the presses. It's beautiful, and as I said, we've been celebrating it throughout this month, um, so folks are invited to order that, or if you're here with us tonight, get a copy. Um, it is certainly part um, of the discussion tonight, but the woman of the hour is Adia Harvey Wingfield. She is a leading sociologist and a celebrated author who researches racial and gender inequality in professional occupations. Dr. Wingfield is the Mary Tileston Heming, excuse me, Hemingway Professor of Arts and Sciences and Vice Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Washington University in St. Louis. She served as president of Sociologists for Women in Society, SWS, and the Southern Sociological Society, SSS. Her latest, her mo latest book before this one was Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy, which Karis had the pleasure of helping celebrate when it launched. It won the 2019 C. Wright Mills Award from the Society for the Study for Social Problems, and she writes regularly for mainstream outlets, including Slate, the Atlantic, and Vox. She lives in St. Louis, Missouri. So it is an honor to have both of you here, and I want to let folks know whether you are here with us in person or you're watching virtually, you can ask questions. If you're here, I'm going to bring you the microphone just so everyone can hear and can make sure it's accessible. And if you want to type your questions into the chat, we will vocalize them um, if you're watching at home so that everyone can hear you. But without further ado, um, please put your hands together to celebrate the new book, Gray Areas. Hey, ER, I want to make sure I'm doing right by you. As well. Let me put the mic a little bit closer. Okay. My students say that I have a bedtime voice, like I'm reading them a story, so I have to really work on projecting. So tonight is just such um, a joy for me. I'm so happy to be here with you this evening, Adia, to talk about this phenomenal work that you've created for us, Gray Areas the way, how the way we work perpetuates racism and what we can do to fix it. Uh, this book is hot off the press with Harper Collins, and I am so excited to be a part of the beginning of what will be a robust book tour. You are booked and busy for the rest <laughs> of the year. Um, and we appreciate so much that you thought enough of the city of Atlanta to be one of the places that you came to discuss the book personally. So before I get into the questions, and if you can see, like I've been doing my homework, I have many, many questions, and I promise not to hog the whole hour. Um, I just want to say a few words of thanks and praise. 
First, thanks to Karis Books and More for being a convener of urgent, important intellectual conversations that we can gather and have and hold space for here in the city of Atlanta. The work that uh, this organization does is just beyond and so important. So we wanna give a shout out everybody to Karis Books and More. Thank you. And ER did a wonderful job of introducing you. So I'm not trying to deal their shine, but I just have to say, if you all don't know who Dr. Harvey <laughs> Wingfield is, in doubt chair, okay? 116th president of the American Sociological Association. <laughs> Her scholarship over more than a decade has informed us within the discipline of sociology and across the social sciences broadly, specifically about how race and gender intersect in work, specifically in white collar work, and especially for black folks. And your work has been indelible to our understanding of that. And you've been at the forefront, but mostly in academia. So you've been helping to edify and educate other academics to help inform our scholarship. But this book is a departure from that in many ways because this is a trade book, meaning that it's for everybody, for a lay audience. And I think that it does a great service because you are in, you have in these 200 plus pages really put in over, you know, over a decade of research and scholarship into what we have here. So I want to start by just reading a passage from the introduction of the book. And from there, I'll ask my first question. So you say in the introduction, you're saying, why work remains a site? where race is central and where black workers bear the brunt of that reality. You go on to say, this means that in the modern era, when many organizations experiment with diversity programming and profess a commitment to principles of inclusion, these efforts in their current iterations are destined to fail. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I want I, I would love to hear you just remark on why this book, why now, and for who? Yeah. So those are some of my favorite questions to to think about, right? Because like you mentioned, this book really feels like the culmination of a lot of sociological work that I've done for our colleagues in thinking about these questions of race and racial inequality and gender in the workplace. But I think it's really important also that as sociologists, we're not just having conversations with each other. That only takes us so far, right? We also wanna make sure that we are talking outside of sociology and outside of our discipline to people who are affected by these issues, to people who might be in positions where they can change and rectify some of the things that we write about. And for me, the guiding question that's been a focal point of, I think all of my research since I came out of graduate school was grappling with this reality that we're well over 50 years past the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed legal discrimination in workplaces. We currently live in an era where there's a multi-billion dollar diversity industry, mm -hmm. right? But at the same time, we know that racial disparities and inequalities still are present in so many of our workplaces. They are present in terms of hiring discrimination. They are present in terms of uh, underrepresentation when it comes to moving into leadership roles. They are present in racial wage gaps. So I've always been motivated by this question of how both of those things can be true, right? How do we live in a society where legal racial discrimination is outlawed, where we focus so much on diversity, and yet we don't actually have it, and we haven't been able to secure it in our workplaces where we spend so much of our time? So that's always been the animating driving question behind my research. In terms of the why now, um, I think I mentioned to you before, I started working on this book in 2020. Mm. So in some ways, that's kind of an answer <laughs> in and of itself. It was this moment where we, as a society, were really having these questions and conversations, rather, 
about systemic racism and workplace inequality and discussions of who was an essential worker and who wasn't and mm -hmm. what that meant in ways that really resonated with me and laid bare a lot of these fault lines around racial inequality and work and how those things are connected and what that means for the type of society that we say we want and what we actually have. So it really was an opportunity to um, have all the things that I've been thinking about over time coalesce and an opportunity to present them in ways that I really hope will reach audiences who, you know, no shade to our discipline, but just people who are not only in sociology. That's the good work. We need that. <laughs> <laughs> and you you mentioned something about, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Also in the introduction, you go through the history of racial inequality and in work. And it was poignant to me because, you know, th this is a history that most of us, especially Black folk, have seared in our subconsciousness and at the epigenetic level understand that from the moment that uh, people of African descent were captured and brought here for labor, right? With the reason for entry being work, right? right? Um, it, it has been an, an, a systemically inequitable and unequal system. And you walk us through how structurally and legally that's evolved and unfolded and changed over time. Um, and you bring us to that 1964 moment. And when I think about that, I'm like, that's when my parents graduated high school yeah. and started working. This, mm -hmm. it, even just the ideal, the idea, mm -hmm. the aspiration that we could have racial equality, racial justice, a level playing field mm -hmm. in the workplace. And that should be something that should be part and parcel to the U.S. experience is, in fact, a new phenomena. Yeah. Why does that historical context matter? Why was that important to kind of lay the groundwork in this book? Yeah, I mean, I, as a sociologist who studies work, I spend a lot of time thinking about work, a lot of time at work, <laughs> and a lot of time just wrestling with this history and what this means for having a better context for understanding racial inequality. And I think a lot of it is exactly what you just described, that Work is one of these spaces, I think, where broadly speaking, we often often construe it in very neutral terms, right? That we have this perception in many cases that the best qualified person for the job gets the job, the person who works the hardest and demonstrates the most value to the company is the person who advances, and that work is just driven by economic production because that's what it is. But we also know, if you take a long view at history, that's never been what work was. Mm -hmm. Work has always been very heavily and clearly racialized uh, in U.S. history, again, from the moment that slavery became a core part of how our nation's economy was powered. These ideas about race and labor, who got to work, what work qualified as work that deserved a wage that people were allowed to keep, who got constructed as uh, simply property rather than people, all of that has factored into how we have historically understood what work is and what good work is and who is seen as deserving of and who belongs in positions where they are doing good work, right? And by good work, I mean uh, work that's decent and well-paying mm -hmm. and offers uh, comfortable wages and allows people autonomy and self-respect and so forth, right? None of those are race-neutral concepts, and they haven't been race-neutral in the U.S., I think, really ever, right? So even this idea of how we think about economic production has always been intertwined with aspects of maintaining uh, racial inequality at a very systemic level. And you're right to point out that when we think about recent, adva recent um, uh, advancements in terms of civil rights laws, that those laws were designed to uh, to make illegal explicit racial discrimination, right? Designed to say that, you know, you can't say to someone openly, we're not gonna hire you because you're black or Asian American or whatever, if that decision was explicitly stated, right? What those laws don't do is necessarily think through or tackle the myriad ways that we still see racial discrimination mm -hmm. persisting, right? I mean, people don't have to openly say, I'm not going to hire you because you're black to not hire you because you're black, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is tied to, again, uh, the ways in which we have ideas about race and labor and who deserves to do certain types of jobs, who deserves dignity from the work that they do, who mm -hmm. deserves respect associated with the labor and the work that they are carrying out. And given that none of those things, as I said, are race neutral concepts, it seems important to have that as the backdrop for what I talk about in the later sections of the book. Oh, and we're going to get into it. <laughs> this book right here. Um, 
So before we get into the substantive por portions of the book, I want to uh, just take a moment to just describe for you all kind of how you've structured and laid this book out um, and give you an opportunity to, to um, lay out the conceptual framework for us. So what I really appreciated about gray areas is that, you know, while you've really taken data from years of research, from hundreds of um, interviewees, you package the chapters up by taking us on the journey with seven composite characters. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that these characters that you've uh, presented to us, Brian and Constance and Kevin, I feel like they're part of my family now. <laughs> I want to talk to them. Um, they really are a composite of, of many, many stories that you've heard from mm -hmm. Black workers and Black professionals. Um, and I think that that's what makes this book so compelling because I certainly saw myself in this book. I know these characters mm -hmm. and also these characters are me too. Okay, sir, certain ones way more than me. Uh, de <laughs> definitely, definitely me all the way. Um, so I really appreciate that, but it's grounded in a really rigorous conceptual and theoretical frame around this gray areas concept that you've put together for us. So I think it's important to give you the opportunity to unpack that for us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it ties into what you were mentioning before in terms of how we think about uh, work in a historical context, right? So as I mentioned, we aren't in this environment anymore where companies can legally openly discriminate. Legally, that is not where we are as a society. Uh, but there are also aspects of work that are very unregulated and tangential to the core aspects of our job descriptions, but still really matter a lot in terms of how we get work done, right? So my job as a college professor, if you look at my job contract, I'm required to do research, teaching, service, sometimes a lot of service, but whatever. But the point is I'm supposed to be doing research, teaching, and service, and that's what's written in my job contract, and that's what's core. But that has never been all that my job encompasses and all that it includes, right? I also am expected to build connections with people in the field that will pay off later if I'm interested in a promotion and tenure process mm -hmm. or just even interested in knowing about opportunities that are present uh, in our profession. I'm expected to know and understand the organizational culture where I work and to know what the norms are and what's considered acceptable and unacceptable, even if that's not openly stated. If I want to move up in advance, I have to develop opportunities for mentors and sponsorship and make sure that I'm positioning myself to know kind of who know who it's important to know and build those relationships. And those things aren't ever going to be in a job contract. But those are the social parts of work. Those are the cultural parts of work. Mm -hmm. Those are the relational parts of work. And so that's what I mean when I talk about the gray areas of what our work looks like. It's not the things that are going to be specified in your contract. These are the things that are still very much part of your job, even if they are not explicitly defined. Sometimes they are ambiguous. They're usually unregulated. And because of that ambiguity, because of that lack of oversight and regulation, that is where we see a lot of potential for racial inequality to become perpetuated. And mm. so what I like to do, or what I try to do with these seven workers is to show how these things are related to their jobs. But again, they aren't ever things that are going to show up in a contract. These aren't ever things that are necessarily going to be covered when they uh, are interviewing or when they sign on the dotted line. But these are things that matter a lot in shaping their work experiences in ways that often are very different from colleagues of other races and can lead them on very different pathways and journeys. And who's, where were we supposed to get the script for all of this? Right, right. right? You right. know, so um, not all, but most especially corporate jobs, mm -hmm. okay, university jobs, uh, jobs with large from in large governmental agencies are predominantly white organizations. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, from a leadership perspective, the bag is coming, yeah. you know, from, from a, from a predominantly white, you know, um, um, leadership base and also um, wealth source. Mm -hmm. So the cultural norms and these scripts and these right. great areas, the playbook is coming from a context that many black workers were not socialized in right. and we never got the script for. Right. So I, I see already like that's, that's a setup to not succeed. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. If you don't, if you don't know that. Yeah. Wow, where we get the playbook at? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not made evident, right? And that's part of what I like to talk about a lot, especially in the discussion of the cultural dynamics of workplaces. Because again, if we think about organizational culture, 
These are often the unspoken norms and expectations that are present in the workplace. And organizational cultures can vary really widely, right? I think in the book, I give the example of police departments being one mm -hmm. example of an organizational culture where certain language and behaviors and actions might be totally acceptable in ways that would not be if you work at an elementary school, right? You, it's not hard to imagine the norms and expectations for behavior being very different in those spaces. But again, these aren't things that people are ever going to tell you outright. These are right. things that become things that you either pick up and learn as you're going along and with varying degrees of success. But for Black workers, the constant that I found is that in many cases, like you said, organizational cultures are rarely, if ever, constructed with Black workers in mind. That is just not mm -hmm. who many organizational leaders are thinking about when they are developing a culture. They are often not attuned to or cognizant of the ways that Black workers are going to experience the organizational cultures that are put forth. And as a consequence, a lot of Black workers struggle with these unspoken norms and unspoken expectations that are never made clear, but then are very easy for them to be unable to, make, to meet and fulfill. And one thing that um, really struck me when you got into the storytelling of the book was this concept of companies saying one thing in their stated goals and ideals mm -hmm. their mission statement or their value statement of being you know places of anti-racist organizations yeah. that strive for equity mm -hmm. and justice and all of that and you know in, in many ways leadership and the entire employee base may think that they are rising to the occasion mm -hmm. and creating conditions under which those ideals can be real. Right. However, uh, in many instances, in many contexts for Black workers, it's nothing like that in the lived reality of what it means to um, be in those spaces, have your body in those places. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, concept of gaslighting came up mm -hmm. early. And gaslighting, like, you know, I, I, I hear you you saying all of this, but that's not my experience right. on the ground. And it can make one wonder, am I losing it? Is it just me? Did that conversation go left because it went left or did I do something or did they just go off on me like mm -hmm. that? Or was that a backhanded, con you know? Yeah. So all of those um, subconscious kind of double consciousness mm -hmm. Um, uh, moments get created through this gaslighting experience. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about that and how gaslighting works in the workplace in particular. Yeah. And there were so many cases of that in the, <laughs> in the book, especially when it comes to organizational culture again, right? There's uh, Brian, who's the film executive who works in this, um, the studio where the company is very open about how they really want to champion innovative ideas and they're really committed to diversity. And he's in Hollywood, which itself has this reputation as being this progressive left-leaning space, right? But then he finds out what happens when he's actually trying to pitch movies that center Black directors or feature Black casts or tell stories about Black people, that what his colleagues often fall back on is this idea mm. that, well, these films aren't going to sell. They're not going to really make money. Nobody's going to go see these movies. We don't really want to invest in these because they're just not really the type of things that we're interested in supporting and pitching, right? So on the one hand, he's being told, we want you to do exactly this thing that you're doing. But then when he does it, also being told, we can't actually support this thing that you're doing that we asked you to do, <laughs> right? I mean, that's just obviously not going to work. And the irony in Brian's case is that uh, data actually disprove what he hears from a lot of executives, mm -hmm. right? That films that actually have more diverse casts and more uh, diverse uh, crews working on them actually do show more of a return on investment. That never gets brought up in his meetings because it's always these colleagues falling back on this colorblind market-based rhetoric that still allows them to marginalize art created by black by black uh, producers, right? There's Constance who works at a university and works at a university that if you look at their website, they will proudly proclaim their commitment to diversity. They have several vice presidents who work in that area. They've got centers and all that good stuff. Constance is a professor of chemical engineering. She's in a STEM field and finds that her colleagues are often willfully oblivious and blind to mm. the explicit racial harassment that she experiences, whether that's openly racist comments and teaching evaluations or people shunning her in her workplace or ignoring her when she sees them off campus or people rebuffing her attempts at collaboration in ways that they don't do for colleagues, right? So 
there are a lot of cases for these workers that really go back to what you're talking about in terms of pushing people to ask these questions and really doubt and second guess themselves and thinking, like you said, am I am I the one who's doing something here? Am I making this up? Is it all in my mind? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I hope really comes out of this book for readers, particularly black readers, is it's not just you. <laughs> it's not just you. It's not in your mind. Mm -hmm. You're not making it up. It's not fabricated. This stuff that you think is happening is actually happening. It is happening systemically and it's happening to a lot of people like you. And that is so empowering. Yes. That's one of the things where it's like knowing that A, you're not alone. You're not the only right. one who has experienced or is experiencing this. And also knowing that it's something that's systemic. I hate that it's still a reality today, but if, if it is a systemic problem, that means that there is a systemic solution right. out there. So that gives me hope. Right. Okay. Um, so let's get into some of these, um, the, the stories of some of these characters. So uh, Kevin and Constance really stood out to me in particular mm -hmm. when it came to this, uh, you know, consistent theme of the intersections of race perceived gender, mm -hmm. and perceived sexuality at work. And those identities don't operate in a silo. They're inter intersectional. Right. And the way that Kevin, who, you know, switched industries yeah. and really thought that he was hopping, you know, going to a, a promised land, but really jumped from the frying pan to the pot. Yep. Um, and Constance, who you mentioned, works in, in higher education. What these two cases in particular pointed out for me is that while Black workers experience racism in the workplace, the way in which Black men mm -hmm. experienced experience racism in the workplace, Black women perceivably, perceive, perceivably ex experience raci racism in the workplace, and non-binary non folks, how they experience racism in the workplace is very, very different. Right. And it's not just based on their own inter intersectional identities that are showing up in the workplace. It's it, it also is largely determined on the leadership, the ethno-racial composition of the leadership at the organization. So I'm saying a lot, but that's so deep. Talk about that for a little bit, and then I have a bunch of questions to ask okay. about that. <laughs> yeah. So I think Kevin is a really illustrative case of this. So he, as you mentioned, uh, started off in the corporate world in banking and finance and was so disillusioned by working in that environment. He just, one, wasn't a person where he just felt like he could really be fulfilled by making rich people even richer. He just, it did not land with him. He didn't enjoy it. And he also didn't really like, again, aspects of the culture there in terms of the uh, forced avoidance of the types of racial issues that he perceived and that he was experiencing. So he thought, you know, I want to do something where I feel like I'm making a difference and I'm having an impact. And so he turned to education. And so he ended up working at this nonprofit focused on education. And he described this journey, which was really hard to hear because he talked about being so optimistic at the beginning and thinking, this is going to be different, right? This is a place where we care about kids and we care about, in particular, uh, helping Black kids, particularly under economically challenging, economically disadvantaged Black kids, this is going to be a place where finally it's going to be the right environment and the right opportunity to do this. That's not what he found, right? And when we think about these intersections of race and gender, um, Kevin's story is really interesting because it operates on a number of levels. In moving into education, he's this Black man working in this predominantly white female-dominated space. And so those intersections of race and gender for him and for many of the white women who were in leadership roles created a lot of conflict and challenge because he already was in the minority because of race and gender, which is something that I've written about before in other research. But he also felt that many of his white women colleagues often pigeonholed him and stereotyped him and just didn't see him as leadership material, right? When he tried to introduce ideas, he often got shot down. When he pointed out how many of his colleagues would often uh, speak very condescendingly and rudely to fa Black families and parents of Black children, despite the stated mission of focusing on racial equity and education, people usually did not want to hear him talk about that. Mm -hmm. And they were very clear about that, right? But at the same time, he also talked a lot about how much tone policing he did and how careful he was as a black man in this predominantly white female space to make sure that he never seemed too aggressive and he never seemed as if he was being too overbearing, that he never interrupted or never seemed like he could in any way behave in ways that might be perceived as a threat. 
And all of those things reflect, again, this experience of being a Black man working in this environment where white women are predominantly in leadership and how those intersections create a really unique uh, roadblock for him that was a parallel to, but not exactly synonymous with what Constance experienced, right? Constance as a Black woman working in this white male dominated environment was also dealing with these intersections of race and gender. But for her, it didn't necessarily manifest in not being too aggressive. It manifested in being ignored mm -hmm. in being overlooked in being silenced and trying to make a case for why she wanted to move into these leadership roles and people consistently ignoring her and picking other people and then coming back later on and saying, oh, we just thought you were so busy with other stuff. Right. But I, but she would say, yeah, but I told you I specifically wanted to do this particular leadership thing. Why would that just not count? Why would you ignore me? Why is it taking other people getting involved to show that I'm qualified and interested and capable in moving into these roles? So it's just, it's really useful, I think, for showing some of the nuance of Black mm -hmm. workers' experiences mm -hmm. so that we don't think that every person's experience is uh, necessarily replicable or synonymous, but that those intersections matter for how we understand what's going on in these spaces. And these these nuances are historically rooted. Right. Yeah. So um, I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit more because there was a um, relief idea, seriously, that you went there to share your respondent stories about their experiences, not just with majority white leaders. It was, you know, Brian and Kevin in particular saying, I've always had difficulty working with white women, mm -hmm. and this is why. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the dynamics that I face as a black man right. in these spaces. Or um, other other uh, characters in the book saying, when working with white men, I am, you know, often pigeonholed mm -hmm. or um, uh, categorized in, in a certain way and have to navigate and move differently. And I don't find that there's often much space to even get to that nuance. Yeah. Um, and it was so liberating that you did that. And I'd love for you to just say a bit more about how how can we take this, this information or at least this, um, um, take these, th these nuances and understand a little bit more about what, what those dynamics on the other side mean for us coming into our workspaces. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I try to think about consistently in all of my projects is trying to shed light on and highlight the complexity and depth of Black people's experiences in workplaces, right? And I, I don't know that I think that's a... When I, when I think about the cultural conversations we have around race and work, I often do not feel like that nuance is present, right? I feel like, as I said, there's this cultural picture of work as being, again, this race-blind space of economic production. Uh, so people are either surprised or shocked when we talk about just how extensive and measurable and observable racial disparities and racial discrimination is in the workplace, or if people are willing to acknowledge that that's a fact and a reality, then that becomes kind of the end point, right? Racial discrimination is a thing that it happens. And that's true, but what it looks like and what the parameters are and what the experiences are can vary wildly for whether we're talking about black workers uh, and how gender matters, how sexual identity matters, how the gender composition of that particular workplace matters. Mm -hmm. And that was why I felt it was really important to include both Constance and Kevin, because they really allowed me to highlight all of those dynamics, right? That you have these workers who, for Constance, for example, again, is in this white male dominated space and what that means for her in terms of the silencing and the gaslighting and the being ignored and just feeling as if she's butting her head against this glass ceiling constantly and struggling so much. And that a similar process is happening for Kevin, even though the circumstances in the environment and the organization are very different, right? This feeling of being this black man, working with white women and just, again, constantly thinking, okay, how, they're being very condescending and belittling, but how do I say that in a way that doesn't make them upset? Because the last thing I need is an accusation that I was too aggressive mm -hmm. or that I was scary or something like that, right? So yeah, I think it, it having conversations framed in that way gives us a much better and broader understanding of Black workers' experiences at work than I think is often present in the types of discussions that are there. Yeah, thank you for that. <sighs> <laughs> Now I have to ask a question about, you know, something that we usually keep under the swept under the rug in the black community. Mm -hmm. And but it's important that you brought it up in this book. I think it's really important that we talk about how it shows up in work. And that is how class intersects yeah. with race 
but within mm -hmm. the black community and how that shows up in work. It was really glaring when you brought it up in the case of Brian, yep. that's our character in the film industry. And just from a personality standpoint, I was, I said, I am Brian, <laughs> Brian is me. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I just loved how surly he is yeah. <laughs> um, and cantankerous, you know, uh, and I've gotten to that point right. in, my, in my 40s, right. okay? So, um, but, but this is really important and I don't want to re reveal too much of what goes on in the book because you all need to get your copies and, <laughs> and read it and then discuss it in book groups and all that. But I can think about how in our own industry of academia, how that looms large. Oh, Tara, I see you in the back. Mm -hmm. Okay, Professor Taylor, <laughs> don't we know it? For those of us in academia, and I can imagine across industries, especially in white collar work, how class really does structure mm -hmm. the lives of the inner workings of uh, black on black relationships at work, but also really um, shapes the way in which race work gets done. Mm -hmm. um, Brian gives a, a great example of that about a DEI officer that was appointed at his firm. Mm -hmm. um, and he felt that this person really came in as turned into the gatekeeper mm -hmm. of all things black, mm -hmm. but really hindered a lot of that uh, black affirming work that he wanted to do mm -hmm. that really represented working class, lower class, right. darker skin, right. black folks and telling those stories. So we can think about how that might play out in film and academia, but in many, many industries. Mm -hmm. And that one really stung, but it's time for us to talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that that was a really uh, interesting case to be able to include for exactly that reason, that he really highlighted a lot of his frustrations around what he perceived as this diversity officer's unwillingness to support certain aspects of Black experiences that he wanted to bring to, to film. And his sense, his feeling was that this diversity officer, like you mentioned, wanted to show certain aspects of Black experiences, but not ones that reflected uh, working class Black people and not ones, and Brian identified as working class himself. So this was very personal mm -hmm. for him, this feeling that this colleague that he hoped and wanted would be in a supportive role did not seem to him to be offering the support that he wanted and hoped that, that he would get. But again, this also was something that the organization was completely unprepared to think through and address, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that it just, <laughs> there was no way. That just was not a thing that they knew how to grapple with and reckon with and think through. And this goes back to my point before about um, organizational dysfunction in many ways and inability to, or not inability, but organizational dysfunction and the tendency that many companies have not to think about what it means to bring Black workers into a space. And that it's not just Kind of we have this neutral space we can bring you in and continue operating business as usual but that it's important to think about what that really means for black workers to be a part of an organizational space and the company was not equipped for that at the same time there's an interesting contrast between uh brian the film executive and darren the corporate vice president that i talk about in one mm -hmm. of the later chapters and i mentioned this in the discussion of uh darren's opportunities for advancement because something that i think is really key for darren in terms of how he got to the position that he did was that he grew up a very upper middle class. He went to very elite schools uh, for undergraduate and for his MBA. Uh, he's been working in the finance industry and he talks about, uh, thank you, Abigail. <laughs> thank you. But one of the things that's really part of his experience is having what we would call this cultural capital of being able to know how to navigate these particular spaces, mm -hmm. right? So on the one hand, you have this uh, black worker coming from this middle class, this upper middle class environment who gets and understands the norms and the things that he has to do in order to make this workplace be a space that works for him. On the other hand, you have Brian, this working class black man who's fought and clawed his way into the space and sees how these types of class divisions can, again, really be an impediment for the production and creation of the type of art that he wants to make that's really reflective of Black communities. And again, this isn't, I think, an aspect of Black workers' experiences that often is part of our current discourse of understanding race and racial inequality at work, but it's important, right? Mm -hmm. It's really critical and it's necessary. It's so important and it could be super hurtful. I can say that as a uh, Black person who proudly comes from a working class family. My daddy was a garbage man, okay? And put me through college, 
picking up garbage. And I'm very, very proud of uh, my parents and uh, our family and, and the values that they instilled in me and very, very honest about the way in which I don't get here as Dr. Brown without the support and love and values of my family. And I don't hide that when I show up to work. Right. What that means by not hiding it is I can speak the King's English if I want to, right. but I'm going to say a y'all <laughs> here and there. I'm going to slip out, you know, and there's a, there's a ratio linguistics yeah. aspect to it. Uh, there is uh, ways in which uh, your class can be marked on the way that you dress mm -hmm. or certain hairstyles or what have you. And those are all choices that many of us make before we even step foot in that office. It's like the thousand and one little things that you have to think about, about how to mask mm -hmm. oneself before getting into the workplace. And many of those things are um, class laden. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And can be a, a huge burden. Yeah. Is gig work going to save us? <laughs> uh, that's a fun, yeah. <laughs> you have, a, you have a, um, a great chapter. There's actually a couple scenes throughout the book where you talk about, um, where you talk about a gig worker and how they speak about gig work kind of like the land of milk and honey because yeah. with gig work, you don't got to deal with no co-workers. Yep. You don't necessarily have a boss. Yep. Um, and that provides a certain sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to know, is that is that where we should go? Yeah. So kind of the opposite is the takeaway that I hope people will take from Alex's story, right? And the reason I included her is exactly what you're describing, right? That I wanted to think about uh, more non-traditional forms of work and how work is changing, right? And these models that we have of people being employed by a company and staying at that company for the duration of their careers and getting a hefty retirement package, those days are gone. That mm -hmm. just When I talk to my students about that, they just give me blank looks that there was a time when people could have pensions that were guaranteed. They're just like, what are you talking about? That's not a thing, right? And it's not anymore. It was right. at one time. So the way that work is shifting now is that people are a lot more likely to do more contract work. People are a lot more likely to work uh, as independent contractors or work through an intermediary firm that then hires their labor or allows the, uh, another company to have a contract with a middle company and workers are able to be contracted uh, to the larger company through that, right? But these models of uh, employees directly being employees for another company, this is shifting a lot. And I wanted to think about what that meant for black workers. And initially, Alex gave some really positive answers. She said all the things that you just described. I don't have a boss. I don't have coworkers. I don't feel like I'm experiencing racial and gender discrimination. You know, I'm just doing my job. I work when I want to. If I want to work more, I can. If I want to work less, I do. And it's just really up to me. And on the face of it, that all sounds fantastic, right? It's the autonomy that I was talking mm -hmm. about before that's associated with work that can be uh, decent and respectful uh, fulfilling work, right? It's the control over your schedule that matters a lot. It's being able to make your own decisions about when and how you work without necessarily having to compete against coworkers. But what you find in Alex's story is one, the opportunities for real economic stability in that work are often very constrained. So Alex was working when I spoke with her as uh, she was driving for DoorDash and Uber Eats. And that wasn't kind of where she intended to do her work, but she had been laid off from a previous job. And she was like, this is fine for now. You know, it's allowing me to pay my bills. It's getting done what I needed to do. So it's basically quite literally getting the job done, right? But the opportunities for people to experience upward mobility and economic security through mm -hmm. gig work are often very scarce. It's much more likely for people to be able to often kind of scrape by and make ends meet. And some of this has to do with the ways that algorithms are constructed in terms mm. of how uh, wages get designed and construed for people who are doing this type of gig work. But also, despite the ways that these companies uh, don't involve working for coworkers, or working with coworkers or having bosses, there's still a lot, of, a lot of ways that discriminatory practices get baked into the very basic design of mm. this type of work. And we've seen studies that show in Airbnb, for example, that uh, black homeowners are less likely to see comparable rates of return if they're listing their houses. Houses in predominantly black neighborhoods go for less even when we're controlling for all the things that are part of uh, what should be the, the payment process through Airbnb. Uh, studies of Uber have shown that people who are trying to get an Uber, if their names indicate that seem to indicate that they are black men, they're likely to have longer wait times mm. and have rides canceled more often. So 
Yes, Alex mm. is in this job where she doesn't have coworkers and she's not measuring herself against other people. But we also know that people's decision making about tipping is often constructed through a racial and gender mm -hmm. lens, right? So it's an interesting picture of where work is going because it highlights how technological advances have really reshaped a lot of aspects of our work and relieved many companies of the burden of having to have employees and all the things that come along with that. But what research does not necessarily show is that that's moving to a place that's very beneficial for black workers writ large, right? They still are subject to these differential outcomes. It just may mean that they're less aware of it because mm. there aren't people who are directly there who can be a basis for comparison. So do you want your racism up front and in your face or do you want it <laughs> later on in the long right. Oh, right. Okay. So I'm thinking of the words of Steve Biko right now, uh, black man, you on your own, mm -hmm. so, but you know, that's not where you leave us right. with this book. And right. that's, that's why I, I love it. So you put it in the subtitle and what we can do to fix it. Right. So I want to close with just hearing you share some of your uh, vision for how you would hope that this book will be used, activated, um, instructive mm -hmm. for, you know, doing that fix it part. Yeah. And who plays a part in that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's an exciting time to do this type of work right now, because there actually is a lot of data that does talk about things that actually work and things that companies can be doing differently. Right. So in the book, at the end of each section, I provide a number of suggestions for different groups, whether you're uh, a colleague, an HR director, a diversity officer, a company leader. There are specific things that people in each of those roles can do to think about how to reconstruct the companies where they are employed. So the first thing I'll say is that a lot of what many companies do has been to rely on practices that we know don't work. And the most obvious example of that is when companies mandate DEI training. Right. So many, <laughs> I got <heard> the <laughs> laughter over here. So many companies do that. And there's so much data to show that mandated diversity training does not improve the numbers of black workers in leadership that for people like me who do this research, mm -hmm. it's so frustrating to see so many places continue doing something that we know is not going to yield results, right? And there's a couple of reasons for that that I can talk about later if people are interested. But we know that some of the things that do work involve instead of mandating DEI training, actually pulling together workers in a company to do uh, diversity task forces. And it's important to do that. It, it, to do that, it's important to have uh, workers from all levels of the organization and to make sure that leadership is supporting and identifying this as a priority. And the reason DEI task forces work better is because when people are coming together from all levels of the organization and given the charge that they're going to identify where these disparities are present, but also that they need to come up with solutions for these mm -hmm. disparities, that takes a whole different level and it takes a whole different, it has a whole different feel to it than what usually comes out of mandated diversity trainings. People are identifying problems, but they're also identifying solutions. And when those people represent all stages of the organization, it's a lot easier and more likely for people not to get overlooked and for different groups not to be missed. So that's really important. Another thing that we know from data actually works is having mentoring programs that are available for everybody and not ones that are invitation only, not that's ones right. that just happen kind of organically, right? And I talk about this a lot in the third section when it comes to advancement, because again, this is an area where so much of advancement is not clear or made explicit. People don't always know what's expected of them for uh, advancement. Uh, in many cases, when ads are posted for a high ranking position, people already know who they want to hire. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opacity around how advancement happens. And a lot of what's critical for navigating that is having a mentor or a sponsor who's willing to take you aside and say, look, these are the things that you need to do. You need to know this. You need to be aware of X, Y, and Z. A sponsor will be the person who behind closed doors and meetings that you're not in will say, you know, we want Karita on this project. She's up and coming and we want to give her a chance. She can really shine and she can really do this. Right. And if that's not a conversation that you're in, you can't advocate for yourself but your sponsor can. So when these programs are open to everybody, the data show that black workers are disproportionately more likely to sign up. They are more likely to be matched with people who otherwise would likely be unaware of their capabilities and their skills. And we are more likely to see them moving into leadership roles mm. as a result of having those relationships and having those ties because men people are driven by their self-interest, right? Mentors want to see their mentees succeed because that reflects well on, on them. So that's another example of uh, things that organizations can do, do differently. I think the last point I'll make, which seems particularly appropriate uh, given that we're in Atlanta, 
Because when we think about hiring discrimination, a lot of hiring discrimination happens through networks and connections that people already have. And I'm not sure that that's an area that's necessarily going to change, but the data does show that when companies broaden their hiring, particularly if they're looking for college-educated workers to historically Black colleges Mm -hmm. and universities, they get different outcomes because they often are exposed to a whole wealth of talent, of motivated, eager, incredibly intelligent young people that otherwise might not be part of their country clubs and (laughs) might not live in their neighborhoods, right? But these aren't exposures that they have unless they are doing explicit recruiting trips to Spelman, to Morehouse, to Howard, Hampton, places like that. When leaders do that, they start to realize there are whole untapped areas that we could be building on and that we should. So these are a couple examples. There are more in the book, but my hope is really, uh, it's twofold. It's, well, it's threefold. My hope is that people who are in leadership roles and organizations read this and think, I need to start thinking about how my workplace Mm -hmm. should be different. This is an optimal, if if my workers are experiencing things like this, which they probably are, this is not optimal for the long-term health of my company and our long-term growth. My hope, like I said, is also that for Black workers, they will read this book and if they've been experiencing these things, will feel a sense of familiarity, but also relief and feel as if, you know, it's, this was not all in my head. This was not just stuff that was made up. These things are real and they're really happening, but there are also things that can be done differently. And I hope that for uh, workers of any race who just want to understand better the question that I started with in the beginning, why do we see so much racial inequality in our workplaces when we've had 50 years plus of legislation, diversity industries, mandated diversity trainings that don't work? Why don't we see things look differently? My hope is that people will read this book and come away with some answers. Well, you give us the answers. We got questions. (laughs) And I want to make sure that we have time to take some questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with folks who are here with us at Karis Books and More. um, And then we'll also field some questions from folks online because we've got lots of people online who I'm sure have questions for you. Sounds good. Hello. Um, Thank you so much for your talk. My name is Temi, by the way. I'm a second year PhD student at Emory. Um, I am so, so excited to read and buy this book. I, um, you bring up a lot of kind of things that you talk about in your work, like signifiers of status, dignity, respect, esteem, value, and how all of these, you know, kind of like who deserves these things. Like this is what makes up their status characteristic, right? Um, and immediately as you thought, you know, you brought up these things, I immediately thought about class. So thank you, Karina, for bringing <laughs> class up um, by asking the question of like, who is socialized to understand this the sort of like script, right, of the white institutional space, how you behave, act, think, emote, like you talk about in your work as well. Um, so my question to that question is, do, to what extent does it really matter whether or not someone is like kind of has that cultural capital to kind of like be able to navigate the space probably better than mm. other people? Like you brought up the examples of Constance Bryant, yeah. who tried to appease their yeah. white coworkers um, by like kind of digging into that cultural capital that they had, you know, like, okay, I know I'm not supposed to, like, interrupt, so let me wait until they stop talking, and then I'll try to, like, non-aggressively, you know, you know, so, like, but they still experienced very clear, discriminate, disparate experiences in the workplace, so I'm just wondering, like, to what extent is it maybe kind of, like, another form of respectability politics almost like to kind of change your like maybe like your tone the way you dress the thing you brought up like your kind of like physical aesthetic right I just wonder in your work in the book maybe like do you did did that ever come up um, with your participants and yeah I guess I'm just wondering like to what extent does it really matter in terms of have like just having more equity in the workplace on an individual, on an individual, but also on an organizational level? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I, do, I think these questions of cultural capital matter. It's hard to quantify. And I don't know if I've seen these studies that do try to quantify how much cultural capital matters, but I think it matters some, but I don't think that having a great deal of cultural capital necessarily uh, negates a lot of the processes that I've talked about here, right? Which is to say that you can, understand kind of how the game is played, so to speak, but you'll still come up against a lot of these structural dynamics and forces because they're organizational. They're not 
things that are necessarily embedded in at an individual level, right? Um, the place where I think I have the most opportunity to talk about that in the book is with Darren, the corporate uh, vice president that I was talking about. And uh, maybe to a lesser degree, uh, there's Max, who's a doctor that I talk about in the mm -hmm. book as well in the same, uh, the same chapter when it comes to their networks and connections. But the reason I say Darren is just because it, I, I wanted to take the opportunity because he talked a lot about uh, not feeling as though he faced a lot of explicit overt challenges in work, which is not to say that they weren't present. But he also talked about feeling as if kind of he understood how to navigate those and he understood how to handle them. And I think a lot of his understanding of how to navigate those challenges came from, again, his upbringing, being middle class, the cultural capital that he was able to bring into the workplace. But it was also important with Darren's example to underscore what the costs and consequences were of navigating those environments, right? So one of the things that Darren said to me was that he understood that in his workplaces, these weren't environments where, you know, you would really talk about race and racial inequality. And it was better to just kind of keep your head down and not make waves. Now, to be fair, this when he made that comment, he was referring to an earlier job, and he had been in several successive positions where the organizational culture did start to shift to be more uh, race conscious. But I bring up that example because it highlights to me that, yes, this is an approach that you can take that's born out of Brian's ability to navigate cultural or to leverage his cultural capital and to know that these are discussions that are not welcome. Yes, maybe that does allow you to advance to a certain point, but then you also have to ask it what costs, right? Because the, the other side of being willing to draw from your cultural capital to uh, conform to and fit into a race-blind environment means that when, not if, but when you inevitably experience some form of racial discrimination or racial inequality, there's not language to talk about that. There's not a framework in place that you can pull from to underscore, underscore for your colleagues that this is occurring and why it's a problem and why it needs to be fixed, right? So yeah, I, I, Darren is the person I think who gave me a window into talking about that in um, what I hope is a really nuanced fashion because he does highlight in some ways a person who does have this capital but also shows the limits of what it can really do. Mm -hmm. hmm. Do we have another question from the audience? Thank you. Hello. Uh, oh, good to see you. Um, <laughs> around the same thing around the cultural capital question, you touched on it very slightly here about kind of HBCUs and kind of that acculturation process that we all go through, going through there, then moving into these white spaces. Some of us came from privilege, like I guess, like the Darren person mm -hmm. versus those who are maybe first generation, but then learn that acculturation process and, or, or social capital uh, to move through these spaces. Did that come up at all in terms of the schooling and the tools at all in, in, in any way or in any planes? I know that the back end, we're all going to get what I like to call your end, your end card, no matter where you come from. But did you look at it or is this not part of that, the coping mechanisms and their ability to cope and move through those kinds of things, depending on where they came from and that kind of acculturation process they may have had? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So in the book, I don't think there are any examples that dwell too heavily on how people's backgrounds may have given them coping mechanisms for the experiences that they face in the workplace. Probably the other closest one, apart from uh, Darren, might be Constance. And even in her case, her um, the coping skill. I don't know, the, the background experiences that she had gave her some coping skills, but they still were fairly limited in terms of dealing with the environment that she was in, right? So uh, Constance also was a, another product of an HBCU. As I mentioned, she's a chemical engineer, and so she went on to this uh, STEM career. Uh, but she also got a lot of really good mentoring while she was a graduate student. So she got a lot of support uh, and um yeah, she got a lot of support and a lot of training early on for how to navigate and understand these spaces. But one of the things that she talks about in the book that's really poignant is how when uh, she finishes graduate school and she gets her first job, she unintentionally switches subfields in her disciplinary area. And so what that means is that all of the support and the networks and the credit that she got, it was all gone like that, right? And so basically she started trying to rebuild everything from the ground up, and it was a nightmare. And that was really where a lot of the issues in terms of her colleagues excluding her mm -hmm. and the difficulties that she faced with students, there was no support structure in place for her. And the things that she, what the support structure that she had cultivated prior just wasn't useful to her in this different environment. So I, I think she and, and uh, Darren are the examples of how 
we see these limitations to some degree of what people can bring into these organizational spaces, being able to really sustain them over the long term, especially if organizations are also not committed to being places that welcome and appreciate and value Black employees. Um, well, we're, nope, we got a question on our virtual folks. Um, this is from Sloan Talbot. Sloan says, thank you so much for this conversation. As evident from your research, we can't trust what companies are saying in their DEI statements. Um, is what they are actually doing um, and match the experiences that Black employees are having, to match the experiences that Black employees are having. Is there a better tool or marker out there for individuals, potential consumers, or prospective employees to evaluate if organizations are really putting their money where their mouth? Yeah, that's a, a great, yeah, it's such a good question. Um, I think there, so one, I think the question is right that I don't know that I would advise using a DEI statement as a proxy <laughs> for what a company is actually doing. But I think that there may be ways to try to dig a little bit deeper and to understand better what actually is happening in a company. One, I would look to the extent possible, I would look into see, I would look to see where resources are being allocated in a company and what that resource allocation looks like. Are resources being allocated to McKinsey to bring in a consultant once a year to run a DEI training? If that's the case, I'd personally be a little bit skeptical, right? Are resources, in contrast, being allocated towards someone who has a leadership role to focus on DEI, who reports to leadership, to the C-suite of a company, who has enough resources and leadership support to be able to ins institute uh, actual programming? I think that looks a little bit different. To the extent that it's possible to talk with people who are in that company and to ask them questions about their experiences, I think that often can be really useful. I know in academia, this is always a, <laughs> a key thing to make sure you get that opportunity to talk with other Black people in a department and to ask what their experiences really, really are and what they really look like. Um, but I, I just, I think it's useful, especially if we're talking about corporate settings. You know, I have been known to quote The Wire on occasion, but... <laughs> It is useful just to be a person who's following the money because that will show you what a company is prioritizing and what they value. And if they aren't devoting, again, resources and personnel and leadership towards DEI, they probably don't really value it very much. Mm. So everybody, I want to just encourage you to stick around, not only to purchase your copy, but you can get a signed <laughs> copy from the Adia Harvey Winfield. And I want to add a fourth way in which I think that this book can be activated and used. For those of you all who work at organizations that have ERGs, employee resource mm -hmm. groups, I think that this is a great book to just... Um, you know, adopt and start a reading group around uh, at your organization. If you do adopt this book and read it as a collective, then invite the great Adia <laughs> Harvey Wingfield to come in and give a talk at, at your organization. I really mean that because this not only is um, a relief and a release, it gives breath and vocabulary to something that we experience so often, but it also, again, and what we can do to fix it. Yeah. We are about that action. And I love that that is the premise of this book. Yes. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>